Firstly, let's look at a brief overview of the algorithm and its history. The Edmunds Karp algorithm was first published in 1970 by Yefim Dinich, although it was independently published by Jack Edmunds and Richard Karp in 1972, leading to the Edmunds Karp name. The algorithm is an implementation of the Ford Fulkerson algorithm, with the main difference in the Edmunds and Karp algorithm being that we follow a set of rules to decide which augmenting path to use next. This leads to, to a more efficient overall algorithm, as we'll see later in the video. In the maximum flow problem, we are given a directed graph with a source and a target vertex, and our goal is to find the maximum flow value that can be pushed along the edges of this graph, from the source to the target. A flow is a function satisfying two simple conditions. Firstly, the flow between two nodes must be less than or equal to the capacity of the edge between the two nodes. And secondly, the total flow going into any node must equal the total flow coming out of that node. The edmunds karp algorithm specifies two rules for how we select the next augmenting path to use. Firstly, we choose the augmenting path with the largest bottleneck value, meaning we choose the path of maximum capacity. Secondly, we must always choose the augmenting path so that it has the smallest number of edges as possible. We can take a look at the algorithm expressed using pseudocode. Our data is a directed graph and the result we want is the maximum flow network for the graph. We begin by setting our flow to zero and our residual network to the given graph. Then, while our residual network contains an augmenting path, we select the path with the minimum number of edges and augment using this path. We then update our residual network. When no augmenting paths remain, we break out of our while loop and we return our value of f. The residual capacity of an edge connecting nodes u and v is simply the total capacity of that edge minus the value of the flow that is already being pushed along it. Let's work through an example. We are given a simple directed graph. Using the second edmunds karp rule, we look for the augmenting path with the least number of edges, and we find a path of length 3. We calculate the flow that can be pushed through the graph by this path. To do this, we need to calculate the residual capacity of each edge used, then find the minimum of these. In this case, we used edges SD, DE, and ET, with a minimum residual capacity of 1, on edge ET. This gives us a maximum flow of 1 that can be pushed using this path. We look for the next shortest augmenting path and find another path of length 3, comprising of edges SD, DF and FT. Again we can calculate the flow value that can be pushed along this path. We find it has residual capacities of 2, 6 and 9. Therefore we can push 2 units of flow down this particular path. Again, we update our graph to show the flow now being pushed along each edge. We look for the next shortest augmenting path and find a path of length 5, comprising of edges SB, BC, CD, DF and FT. Again, we calculate the flow value that can be pushed along this path. We find it has residual capacities of 3, 4, 1, 4 and 7. Therefore, we can push one unit of flow down this particular path. Again, we can update our graph to show the flow now being pushed along each edge. We look for the next shortest augmenting path and find a path of length 6, comprising of edges SB, BC, CE, ED, DF and FT. Notice that we can push one unit of flow from vertex E to D, as we already pushed one unit of flow from D to E in the previous path. Again, we calculate the flow value that can be pushed along this path. We find it has residual capacities of 2, 3, 2, 1, 3 and 6. Therefore, we can push one unit of flow down this particular path. Again, we update our graph to show the flow now being pushed along each edge. At this point, we can't find another augmenting path for our graph. We now need to find the maximum flow that can be pushed from the source to the sink of our graph. To do this, we just add up the flow values we calculated for each augmenting path, giving us a maximum flow of 
our example of 5. Now, we shall proceed to the analysis of time complexity of the various algorithms we have discussed. Here, we are interested in the worst-case scenarios as those will give the upper bound of the time complexities, and hence the efficiency of the respective algorithms. First, let us start with Ford and Fox's algorithm. In a situation where all the edge capacities are integers, for each iteration, we will find an augmenting path with at least one unit of flow, and hence the algorithm will terminate after at most f star iterations, where f star denotes the actual maximum flow. On the other hand, in each iteration, we could construct the residual graph and find an augmenting path without any constraints by performing and whatever first search, both in O E time. Thus, for network with integer capacities. The Ford Foxes algorithm runs in OEF star time in the worst case. For small scale networks, this is certainly not bad at all. However, the runtime could explode if F star happens to be large and the bottleneck edge in the augmenting path has small capacity. Consider the network shown. In the worst case, we have to run 2000 iterations as compared to only two times in the best case to obtain the maximum flow. This is exactly why the Edmunds Cup algorithm is more efficient in practice, as it picks augmenting paths in a way that the edges with small edge capacities would not be included in the paths too often. Interestingly, Ford and Foxen's algorithm may not terminate if there is an edge with irrational edge capacity. This is because that we could always have an augmenting path in our residual graph with irrational edge capacity with a bottleneck edge capacity converging to zero but never equals to it. If we try to stop the algorithm at some stage and retrieve the answer, it may not even be close to the actual maximum flow. The classic example of such case is shown below. Due to time constraints, we will not demonstrate it here. However, you can read the details of this example in the link in the video description. Now, let us analyze the two rules the Edmonds Cup algorithm used to choose the augmenting path. First, being to choose the augmenting path with the largest bottleneck value, and the second is to choose the augmenting path with the smallest number of edges. Picking augmenting paths with largest bottleneck value is essentially a greedy approach. Although it will ensure that the number of iterations before the algorithm terminates will be significantly reduced in the worst case, it's expensive to find an augmenting path with the largest bottleneck value itself. In fact, we need O E log V time to compute it in each iteration. Furthermore, the time complexity is still dependent on the logarithm of the actual maximum flow, leading to O e square log v log f star overall worst case complexity. On the other hand, if we choose to pick the shortest path from the source to the sink in each iteration, then it happens that the time complexity is no longer dependent on the actual maximum flow. We could prove that the unweighted distance of the augmenting path containing the critical edge would increase by at least 2 between disappearance and reappearance. Hence, each edge can disappear at most v over 2 times as the unweighted distance of an augmenting path containing this particular edge is strictly increasing by at least 2 and bounded by v. After all, with e edges, we will observe at most e v over 2 edge disappearances. Finally, for each iteration, we could find the shortest augmenting path in the residual graph in OE by performing breadth first search. Thus, the algorithm runs in OVE squared overall.